Please join me in welcoming to the Distinctive Voices podium, Dr. David Casales. So my laboratory is called the Biomimetics and Nanostructured Materials Lab, and it really does reflect what I do. I look at organisms that have various structures and functions, whether they're uh, a strong and tough organism or they're optically diffusing organism, and I try and understand what are their properties and struct. well first, what are their structures from the nanoscale up to the macro scale, I try and understand how those structures relate to their function, and then utilize engineering materials to replicate what those organisms are made of to try and enhance the performance. And the other half of my lab says, well, um, what are these organisms made of and how are they formed? So we try and understand the formation of a lot of biological minerals, shells, teeth, bone, and utilize strategies that those organisms use to create their architectures to make nanoscaled materials for energy conversion, energy storage. So basically solar, if you will, and batteries. And so my research, as Jennifer had said, I have a variety of different kinds of students. You know, I'm a material scientist. Um, don't tell the chair of my department who's a chemical engineer. Um, but uh, the group that I have, really, we have um, expertise, if you will, in material science and, and chemistry, but I also rely on collaborations. And I think collaborations are really is uh, very important in order to accelerate your research. So all these other tangential areas, uh, we utilize um, collaborations from all over the world. And so, as I was mentioning, my group has two main thrusts. One is, can we learn from biologically mineralized organisms, and I'm going to talk about this critter in a little bit, to make impact-resistant, lightweight materials. And I actually just came back on Sunday from the UK where I did a whirlwind tour of uh, Formula One racing and some Ministry of Defense and uh, uh, so uh, who are very interested in this, these types of things. And as I mentioned, the other half of my group says, well, here's a biological structure. It's actually the inner lining of a, of a California red abalone. Uh, it's otherwise known as mother of pearl, if you've ever seen that. This is what its shell structure looks like. And we try and understand how that shell grows. What's the mechanism by which it forms? And can we use that strategy? These are battery materials. Next generation lithium ion battery materials that we want to make fast charging, high energy dense batteries that you can take your electric vehicle and drive from here to San Francisco in one charge. So that's kind of the two halves of my group. So in my lab, we ask different questions. And as I said, I'm a bit of a quirky guy. Uh, but we'll ask, can we learn from mollusks or squid um, that, uh, how, what their structures are and how they can make abrasion-resistant materials so that we can actually utilize that in engineering application. And the other question, of course, is can we learn from crustaceans, uh, this is a crustacean, about making impact-resistant materials. I'm a big sports fan, so NFL football, there's obviously a lot of issues with concussions. Uh, and as I said, every time I go to Europe, I have to put this in here for impact resistance. So, okay. We ask, why can't she be more happy? So why is she not happy here? She's probably dislocated her shoulder, but I'm sure that will heal and she'll get over that. But she just ruined her $3,000 carbon frame bicycle. I'm sure she's not happy about that. And so um, we want to try and address those problems. And on a more serious note, um, why can't we protect our soldiers? You know, they're in harm's way overseas. And uh, if you're a soldier in Afghanistan or Iraq, you not only have to wear a Kevlar vest, you have to wear inserts. Uh, these are called sappy plates, small arms protective inserts. And so they will hopefully stop, uh, you know, high uh, caliber rounds like 308 rounds. Unfortunately, it says handle with care. Well, what, wait, this is supposed to, you know, protect our soldiers. What it means, if anyone's in the military, you realize that if you're hit with a round that's a you know, high caliber round, um, it's a one-off. So these will fa they'll, they'll stop the bullet, but after that, it's almost useless. If you hit it again with another round, it's not really very protective. So what soldiers do is they'll just drop them in the field. I had a meeting with some Navy SEALs in some abandoned warehouse somewhere in Florida uh, a few months ago, and I found out some of the details. And in fact, these are 31 pounds of extra weight that they're wearing in the desert. And so why would they wear something that's weighing them down if it's not going to protect them? So we try and address those issues. 
Um, why can't we charge our electric vehicle uh, faster? That's another one. Nobody wants to sit at the gas pump or the electric pump for hours at a time. Uh, and then the last one that I will address is, why don't you want to live near Lance Armstrong? So hopefully you'll start thinking, what the heck do I mean by why don't I want to live near Lance Armstrong? But we'll get to talking about making clean drinking water. Okay, so how do we solve these problems? In my lab, we look at nature. We try and understand natural systems, use them as either examples of high performance or inspiration for making these new materials. And there's a whole different variety of classes of components that could be inspired from, uh, from studying these organisms. So I'm not going to go through all these, but you can imagine just, in fact, I just had a spider silk meeting right before I came here uh, trying to make high strength materials. But there's all these different types of applications that nature's already provided. And the nice thing in our lab is uh, nature's done this for a few hundred million years, so we're essentially stealing from nature's blueprint. It makes it life easier. So let's start with this topic. Can we learn from a mollusk or a giant squid about making abrasion resistant materials? I'll, I'll tell you a small story about the squid. I won't talk about them today, but we actually went to, uh, so doing research is not only in the laboratory. You know, when you look at natural systems, uh, we went to uh, um, the, um, the uh, Mexico uh, to go uh, deep sea fishing for these giant Humboldt squid. And we were interested in them because, you know, they're powerful, they can overturn boats. And so I brought my postdoc with me and we're, we're in the ship and we're pulling one of these guys up on board and he reaches down to pull the hook out of it and it grabbed onto his arm and uh, he pulled away and there was blood. And I said, cool, he didn't think it was so cool, but he th I thought it was cool because if you look at an octopus, octopus have suckers on their rings, right, to, on, their, on their arms to capture their prey. These guys have suckers with teeth in them. So they'll literally compress their suckers and the teeth will go into your flesh and grab onto their prey. So that's what happened to my postdoc. Uh, anyway, he left, he left my lab soon after that, so maybe there's a <laughs> cause and effect. So anyway, I'll talk about this mollusk here. Um, but before that, I'm going to bring you into my material science 101 class. So are there a lot of material scientists or should I be afraid to tell you? Okay, all right. All right. I know there's one good friend of mine here. Um, so if I take a piece of chalk, and we don't use chalkboards anymore. There are a few on campus that's now whiteboards, but it tells you how old I am because when I was in school, uh, up to college, we were still using chalkboards. So uh, if I take a piece of chalk and rub it across the chalkboard, I'll deposit the chalk onto the chalkboard. And that's because the chalk is softer than the chalkboard. So it wears away, it abrades. Now, if I'm a bad student or I didn't like the grade my professor gave me, I'll go into the room with a chisel. And I'll take the chisel and if I do the same thing, the chisel will actually scratch the chalkboard. And of course, that's because the material in the chisel is harder than the chalkboard. Okay, so abrasion resistant hard materials are very important in engineering applications. This is actually, these are people. Um, this is the, one of the tunnel boring instruments that was used to go between France and England. So abrasion resistant materials, oil drilling, uh, dental materials, shaping, machining, all require hard abrasion resistant materials. So this has application. Can we learn something from nature? Well. Let's go from the engineering world to one of these islands. This is actually in Palau. Um, so I didn't go here yet. I'm trying to get some funding and hopefully NSF will let me, they won't see right through me so that I wanna go and go scuba diving. But, um, so I'll ask a question, I'll ask a question to the audience. Um, how do you think this island formed? So I'm gonna ask the two that said I looked younger. I, I appreciate that. How did this island form? Most people think it's erosion from wave action that just, uh, um, you know, cuts, undercuts the island. But there was a uh, marine biologist named Hans Lowenstam back in the 1960s who wanted to investigate this. So he went uh, up underneath this rock to take a look, a closer look. And what he found were these scratch marks on the rock. And near, the, uh, near these scratch marks, he saw this critter um, called a chiton, C-H-I-T-O-N. A chitin is a mollusk, it eats algae. And in order to get to the algae, the algae is growing on the rock, but it's also growing within the rock. 
So the chitin has developed a specialized set of teeth. Um, if you can click on that, uh, on that slide, please. Maybe. Uh, one second. There we go. So what the chitin does, these are in our tanks at the university. It has a specialized set of teeth here that will go out and scrape away the rock. Um, and then as it does this, it's getting access to the algae that it subsequently eats. So I'm going to call this snail Martha, because I have a friend in the audience named Martha. So she's happy about that, I'm sure. So, so Martha has a specialized set of teeth called the radula. And it's basically a long ribbon. And the ribbon contains lots of hard, mineralized teeth. That's these little pieces right here. They're tricuspid. Uh, teeth. And basically, Martha will use that, that structure to rasp along the rock and cut away the rock. So this is actually what its teeth, we did some dentistry on Martha, sorry. Uh, and you can see this is the active region of the radular structure, this, this belt of teeth. So the outer 20 teeth or so, there's about 75 rows of teeth here. The outermost 20 are actively used in rasping. But if you go back into Martha's mouth, you see the teeth go from a black to an orange to a yellow to a clear. I wish this happened to me. What this organism is doing is it's actively forming new teeth every few days. So it will literally um, cut off the last, couple of, last row every few days and push forward a new row of teeth. So it's forming new teeth. And I have so many amalgams in me, I really wish I could have done this. So, okay. So what do these teeth look like? This is actually an electron micrograph um, that shows that there's this ribbon structure underneath, and then there are these little flexible arms that are made of organic um, with the fully mineralized teeth sitting on top of them. So they literally will just rasp along the rock. So we did some investigation. We, as, as a scientist, we want to know uh, what are these things made of and how are they so hard and abrasion resistant? So what we did was, or my student did, was took the teeth and embedded them in some resin and then sectioned them, cut them, uh, both at the top here and at the bottom. So you can see um, there's a tricusp one, two, three here. So if you look at the top part of the tooth, uh, this is a specialized kind of microscope uh, that, well, it's a scanning electron microscope that uses what's called backscatter, that anything that's brighter here means the atomic number, uh, there's high, higher atomic number elements in here than there are here. So there's some mineral in here. But you can see at the tooth cusp, it's uniform. But as you go down into the tooth, it actually has a core shell structure, much like your own teeth, right? We have enamel and dentin in our teeth as well. But this is not made of calcium phosphate like the teeth that we have. So we did this. We wanted to find out what exactly are these teeth made of. So we ground up the teeth and did what's called powder x-ray diffraction, and we got a diffraction pattern to tell us what these minerals potentially are. And we found out they're magnetite. So these teeth are magnetic. Now they're made of iron oxide, which is cool. Um, so they're, they're roughly about a half a millimeter tall. So if we drop them on the floor, it's easy to find. We just take another magnetic star bar and pick them up, which is pretty cool. So. Um, What's so interesting about magnetite? Well, it happens to be a very hard biological and geological mineral. Um, this is what's called the nano indentation map. Each one of these little pixels here represents a diamond probe that we push into the sample. So we took those same sectioned teeth here, and you can see that the outline right here, pushed in to determine the local mechanical properties. So the purple here is just the surrounding uh, resin, the epoxy. So it's, for example, its hardness here is very low. But if you look at the tooth, the leading edge of the tooth, it actually has quite a hard, uh, quite a high hardness. And the trailing edge of the tooth is softer. And we think that design is there for a self-sharpening reason. Uh, so that as it's rasping, the, the leading edge is going to stay intact, but the trailing edge will slowly wear away. So it actually is always uh, sharpening. But the core contains some other material that I'll show you in a second that actually allows the tooth to survive against some catastrophic. It won't break completely in half. So this is just a little map of that. So if we compare, this is what's called an Ashby plot. So I can compare different classes of materials 
compare their hardness with their modulus is another word for stiffness. How stiff are they? And so, does anyone surf in here? I, I did when I was in warm water, but I won't in California. It's too cold. So anyway, ABS is the primary component of a lot of surfboards, so it's a, so, it's a polymer. Um, so these are all polymers here, but if you go up this slope here, uh, you can see as you get increased stiffness or increased hardness, you get metal alloys, uh, steels, uh, zirconium oxide, so ceramic materials. One of my friends in the audience is an expert in ceramics, I have to tread lightly. Uh, aluminum nitride, silicon nitride, and tungsten carbides, materials that are used in tools, tooling uh, drill bits. So, why did I show this? Here's your tooth on this map, right? Tooth enamel. So, what it means is, based on my lecture that I gave you about rubbing chalk on the chalkboard and the chisel, it means that you shouldn't go in home and chew on your stainless steel pot. Okay, you won't fare very well, don't do that. Uh, you probably shouldn't try these anyway. But anyway, so that's the hardness of tooth enamel and an abalone shell I also show. So where does the chitin, uh, the material properties of the chitin lie? This is a log-log plot. So we're talking order of magnitude between these. And so it's significantly harder and also stiffer than human teeth. And, it, and what biology has done here is it's selected the materials the material components that are accessible to it, because biology doesn't have access to tungsten carbide. Okay, so there's iron dissolved in the ocean that it can actually sequester using specialized proteins called ferritins that will then pump in this material into the teeth. Okay, so now there's engineers I heard in this room, so there's going to be a quiz after this, and here's what the quiz will be based on. If I take two materials of high stiffness and low stiffness and I put them in a periodic array next to each other in a composite and I place this material under tension, I pull on it and put a crack in it, one of two things can happen. That crack can either propagate through completely or the crack can deflect. If you take a ceramic plate, you know, if your dinner plate, you drop it on the floor, what happens? It fractures catastrophically. But composite materials where you have a high and low modulus if, and this is what the quiz will be about right here, if the difference, basically it boils down to if the difference of the stiffness matters or, or is greater than a factor of four, we would expect to get cracks deflecting at interfaces. So what biology does is they'll assemble materials in a hierarchical structure with these interfaces so that a crack propagating will not go right through, it will have to be deflected. And there's a lot of energy absorption or toughening that occurs due to this. And so if we look at these teeth, here's the core of the tooth, here's the shell of the teeth, here's the stiffness. If I do my basic math, it is greater than a factor of four. We would expect cracks to be deflected, right? And so here we see a crack that's in the core of the tooth. It propagates, but it's deflected by the shell. So this just shows this interface um, this is one way that biology uses its structures to toughen its components. So we go to these nano indents that I've made. Remember I pushed that little diamond probe and I got that little map with all those dots. So these are the little dots. If you look up close, um, this would be, for example, the core of the tooth. So because it's a softer material, the probe goes in deeper. On the outside, it's a harder material. The probe does not penetrate as deeply. But we interestingly found that there are cracks that all are along the side of the tooth. These cracks are going along the tooth. They don't propagate into the tooth. So I ask the question, why? I can take credit for probably one picture on this whole presentation, and that's this one, where I fractured the tooth and I went into the microscope because I couldn't wait for my grad student. So I was up at two in the morning and I said, I want to try this. So this is actually the tooth fractured um, and on the shell of the tooth, you can see it's actually made of these little nanostructures, nano rods of magnetic material. These are the nano rods right here that are all aligned parallel to the long axis of the tooth that give the tooth incredible hardness, but also uh, some strength along its long axis. This is actually more evidence. These are the, the nano rods that we actually see, these magnetic nano rods. There's actually organic surrounding each nano rod. So not only is it a hierarchical structure from the core and the shell of the tooth, but even within the shell, it's hierarchically assembled such that each little nano rod is surrounded by something less stiff. So you have a lot of deflection through these nano rods as well. And by the way, this organic here is responsible 
for assembling and growing this mineral as well. So we take advantage of that when we make nanoscale materials. So where are we going with this? Well, we're now making abrasion-resistant coatings, uh, thin film materials, but now not, we're not making them out of magnetite, we're making them out of a material that actually is self-cleaning as well. So we're trying to take multiple components, something that's hard that we learned from a design from nature of making these hard uh, nano rods, but using instead of a magnetic material, using some uh, semi-conducting material that's actually self-cleaning. So that's the direction we're going uh, with that. Okay, I wanna jump into one of my favorite topics, and we have about 15 of these guys in our lab, and uh, they're called the mantis shrimp. So what's the motivation behind this study? Uh, again, I just came back from all these uh, aerospace and uh, automotive meetings in the UK where they're interested in making lightweight materials that are both strong, stiff, and tough. But getting something that's stiff and tough is very challenging for engineers. And the components that engineers that we use will use metals and integrate them with ceramics or polymers uh, to try and make a composite material, some mixture of these materials but you notice that we can't really get the best trade-off of, of, of stiffness and toughness. There's always some loss somewhere. And as engineers, we try and build things that are so strong, when they fail, they fail catastrophically. And nature does something different, uh, which I'll show in a second. So what does nature do? So nature provides not just hierarchical construction of minerals and organics to make strong, lightweight, uh, tough and stiff materials, they incorporate multifunctionality. Their self-healing abilities, right? You yourselves are able to self-heal. You have bones, right? If you fracture your bone, they heal. You have sensing elements incorporated into your structures. So somehow, the aircraft industry would love this, right? Is to make lightweight fuselages with sensing elements, uh, self-healing elements incorporated into it. Nature does this very well. So, what does nature use? I mentioned those chitin teeth are formed using some organic and mineral. Nature only has access to certain types of proteins, um, and polysaccharides are basically just complex sugars. You know, cellulose is one of those. Chitin, uh, chitosan is found in the exoskeletons of crab, which hopefully my wife and I will eat tonight. Um, and minerals. So we have minerals of calcium carbonate, basically chalk. Um, calcium phosphate, that's what your bone mineral is. Uh, biosilica and uh, iron oxide would be another one I would add to this. So that's the material selection that nature has available to it. It doesn't have, like I said, tungsten carbide or something like this or, uh, or uh, carbon nanotubes. So nature does something different. They take stiff components like calcium phosphate found in your bone and protein, but they assemble it at this really intricate hierarchical structure that yields materials or composite materials that do have a good trade-off with stiffness and toughness. And so the area of research that you know, we focus in this region uh, in our laboratory, we look for materials that are both stiff and tough. So let's get to what, uh, an example of a stiff, tough organism, if I, okay. There we go. So this is a mantis shrimp. A mantis shrimp is not a shrimp. A mantis shrimp is a crustacean. And it has a similar body plan of a shrimp. In the front, it looks like a praying mantis. That's where it gets its name. So uh, let's see. I'm going to use my friend Martha again. Martha may have some PhD students that don't come into the lab all the time. I have some of that problem, too. So what do I do? Or Martha does. Maybe this will be the student, and this will be Martha. She's angry. And she pushes them against the rock and says, hey, get to work. But what the mantis is really doing here, it's feeding. So it's eating a snail and how it actually gets to the snail's meat, because the snail goes back inside when it's attacked, it has to crack open this shell. And for decades, this structure, this shell structure, I showed you that layered structure earlier, I said it's the abalone, that was considered the gold standard of biological inspiration for making next generation tough composites. And yet the mantis shrimp eats those guys for breakfast, right? So we said, that's pretty cool. So what does the mantis do? Well, it uses these structures, they're called dactyl clubs, and the dactyl clubs will, underwater, accelerate faster than a 22 caliber bullet. So it's one of the fastest striking organisms on the planet, underwater. And so if we look at this, it's able to generate forces. The mantis are only about four inches long. 
Um, and by the way, we don't put them in glass tanks in my lab for a reason. <laughs> we keep them in plastic tanks, and guess what? Just a few days ago, I like to play in the lab, and new students that come in have to get their hand put into the tank. No, I'm just, we don't do that. But, but now they're cracking the acrylic uh, tanks as well. They're incredibly powerful, and they're aggressive, and they're territorial. So you would never put two of them in the same tank together. I made that mistake when I started studying these in 2007. I put them in, went to the restroom, and came back. One was floating. So, so they're territorial. But they can impact with incredible amounts of force, and because they're accelerating through water with incredible rate, they're literally shearing the water and creating cavitation bubbles. They're boiling the water around them. And you, oh, excuse me. you can actually see this. Let me see if I can show you that video. Oh, can you click on that, please? There you go. So there it is impacting the snail. And that flash right there or right there, that's a cavitation event. So the, their poor prey not only have to put up with a punch, they also have implosions of these bubbles hitting on the, uh, uh, imploding on them. And they can do this tens of thousands of times. The mantis can do this tens of thousands of times without breaking its own fist. So, you know, obviously I ask my students to try and hit a wall. They're not going to do that because they're going to break their hand right away. So how does it, what is this material made of and how is it architected that makes it so tough and impact resistant? So I'll talk a bit more about the science behind it. So we did a, a CT scan. This is the body plan of the mantis. This is its carapace, its exoskeleton. But here's its club. And by the way, the mantis evolved 500 million years ago. Uh, they originally were spear fishermen, or women, uh, and they would spear fish soft-bodied prey. So they would use this. There's actually a vestige right here, this little pointy spike. So there were spearing types of mantis. But over the next 100 million years, those soft-bodied organisms developed exoskeletons, crab, clam, things like this. So the mantis tried to eat those too. And it couldn't with its spear. So it's tried to use its, its elbow. It's really its elbow, not its fist. And the well-endowed elbowed mantis split off into the smashing kind. So there still exists a spearing kind and a smashing kind. So this is the smashing kind we're studying. So we've taken this club. This is what's its dactyl club. And we've cut it in half and basically looked at its microstructure. The outside of the club, this is again this backscattered electron microscope uh, micrograph. Uh, that where anything that's a heavier element will show up brighter. So this is a brighter region. This is where it's impacting its prey. Behind this, there is this periodic region, and then there's this other region on the side, and I'll explain what those are. So again, this is just an optical micrograph showing that the, there are crystals inside this impact region, and those crystals are oriented in some specific direction, and that plays a very important role. There's this periodic region, and here this, this side region, I'll call the striated region. So we did some analysis on this impact region. And what this is, we went to Brookhaven National Lab in, up, uh, in New York and did what's called synchrotron x-ray. This x-ray is about 100 million times more intense than a chest x-ray. So you probably wouldn't want to stand in front of this beam. And what we did with this beam was we interrogated what the material components were and how they were oriented. And we found that the outer region that you saw in the other micrograph that was white, this is a highly crystalline and oriented calcium phosphate, and specifically the same mineral that's found in your bone. So this is a bone-like mineral that's highly oriented, made at room temperature, and stronger than an engineering ceramic that's famous for being you know, quite strong, silicon carbide. So it's quite impressive. The inside of the club also consists of calcium phosphate and calcium carbonate, other minerals, but it's amorphous. There's no periodic arrangement of atoms within the structure. Okay, this side region, this is what I call the striated region. It's located here in green. What that is, these are fibers that I show here. They're mineralized fibers that are literally, just like these beads that I'm wearing on my wrist, they're literally wrapping around the entire club circumferentially, and they keep the club under compression. So you see Manny Pacquiao wraps tape around his fist before a fight, and that's because when he punches, there's a tendency for the fist to expand laterally. Well, ceramic materials don't do well when they're pulled in tension. So by keeping things under compression, there's a less, uh, there's a less like, a likelihood of cracks uh, propagating and failing. So this band of fibers that wraps around the club keeps everything compressed. 
And then I mentioned about the, the earlier uh, mantis, the 500 million year old mantis was a spear fisherman. This is the spear fisherman right here. It also has these fibers wrapped around it, but it has it wrapped around its, its spike. And we think those, those fibers wrapped around the spike keep the spike from torquing during a penetration event, much like these guy wires uh, keep this tower standing up straight. Okay, so this is the, what we find is one of the most exciting regions of the club is this interior, which we call the periodic region. So when we first made the, or when we first analyzed this club, we polished it flat. We noticed all these cracks and these cracks have this, this C pattern to them. What, what's going on? Where are cracks forming and where do they go? So we fractured open the club and when we did in this region here, and when we did that, we see this structure. So this structure is called a bulligan structure or a helicoid. So all a helicoid, and the schematic shows it very well, is you've got unidirectional fibers that are oriented, let's say, in zero degrees. The next layer that's stacked on top of it is stacked at some small angle, let's say two or three degrees. Then there's another at six degrees and nine degrees, et cetera, until each, there's a complete 180, 180 degree rotation of these fibers. And then it will repeat itself over and over again. So why is this structure so important? What does it do? for toughening the club. So um, what we found was the club, after about 10,000 impacts, I didn't have a grad student counting the impacts, of course, but we get estimated it based on the fact that a mantis every three to six months will basically molt, it will shed its club and form a new one. Um, so based on our feeding habits, we estimate, and, and knowing that between molts it can impact from 10 to 50,000 times, this was somewhere 10 to 20,000 impacts. So notice, so what this is, this is a, a section of the club, we cut it in half, and this is this backscatter image where you see the brighter mineral, this is the periodic region. This periodic region has a lot of, these are nano cracks. So how we got this is we basically put this club under a microscope, an electron microscope, and we let the beam just sit there and charge. And so anytime you have some high surface area material, it tends to charge up the electrical, uh, the uh, electricity essentially can't escape out of the club. So it charges up. So all of these little wire looking structures are cracks. So I mentioned earlier that engineers build things so strong that when they fail, they fail catastrophically. Biology has a different strategy. It says, well, let's build it strong enough. There will be cracking here, but none of these cracks leave the club. So it stays intact. And remember, this is after tens of thousands of times of impacts. So the structure, that bulligan structure, what we found was, and a little bit of engineering here, is that it's not just those deflections. Remember we were talking about the teeth where there's a, uh, if you have a modulus stiffness difference of greater than four, you have this deflection of cracks. You also have this twisting of cracks and that provides a significant amount of toughening for these composites. So what do we do? Well, we wanted to figure out what that angle of pitch was. We went back to the x-ray and determined what that angle was. It was really small, less than two degrees per layer of rotation. And well, that takes a lot of effort. So we said, well, why don't we try and mimic this structure? So we went back to the mantis. We knew what its design was. We knew that this is made of calcium phosphate and some sugar-based fibers, some fibrous material. Well, that's great, but if we want to make one of these types of materials, we'd probably want to use an engineered material. So we, we swapped out some of these materials for carbon fiber and resin, epoxy resin, which is found in your typical aircraft. And we used a strategy that aircraft uh, industry, uh, or processing method that aircraft industry uses to make its composites. And we said, let's make all these different rotational angle composites and compare it to an aircraft standard, which is this one, quasi-isotropic, and let's see how they show against each other. So this is actually just a section through one of these composites, and I actually brought, I brought some with me here. So uh, I'll leave them in the bag because there are some fibers in here and you might not want to hold on to them, but there's three different types of, of panels in here. I've got one made of glass fiber. Uh, the middle one, the yellow one, is Kevlar. And the back one is, uh, is uh, uh, carbon fiber, so if somebody wouldn't mind taking that. So this is, if it says quasi-ISO, it means it's the aircraft standard. Yep, and then, yes please. And then this one, the other one that says helicoid, is what we mimicked from the mantis shrimp. So this is the composite that we made for the mantis. So the composites I'm passing around are the same thickness, the same weight, 
but the different architecture here. And then we said, well, how do they perform? So we used an aircraft standard test method that Boeing uses to test its composites. So we took one of those panels and put it in this device here, this impact tower. It basically drops down, slams down onto this panel, and we can determine how much impact it can take. I also use it as a scare tactic for my students to say, uh, if you don't, can you hit this video? So we put their hand in here, the student's hand. It clamps down, and then this thing will... Oh, you need to play the, uh, the audio. There you go. Maybe you play that with sound. It's more intimidating for the, <laughs> the students, right? If you can... Yeah, there you go. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. So it's an incredible amount of force. So again, the aircraft industry uses this to determine how much damage occurs in their, uh, their composites. So this is actually the, the composite from the Boeing 787, if you've flown one of them, they're beautiful. Uh, but the puncture, this is the backside of the panel, that impactor went through this panel. And there's lots of damage to it, but most importantly, the, the puncture goes through. If we compare to the Mantis, the puncture doesn't go through. There is damage, but it hasn't catastrophically failed. Just some splits and delaminations, we call them. So if we compare this, what the aircraft industry will do is look at how deep the dent from that impactor goes in. So the quasi-isotropic, which is our aircraft industry, went in 1.25 millimeters. The Mantis Mimic went in 49% of that. Same weight, same material, same process. Pretty cool. The aircraft industry also does, does an additional test. They say, well, how strong? Let's say the wing took some impact. Well, how strong is it after impact? So we have to mount these composites in some specialized uh, machine and we measure how much residual strength. Here is the residual strength of your aircraft standard and then the Mantis mimics are almost 20% stronger after impact. Yes? Oh. Okay. So, Riverside. Riverside is out in the desert, almost. If you drive 30 more minutes east, no one cares what you do. <laughs> I think so. I know so, because no one found out about this until I told people. So I have a student. Uh, he has a, he's in the military, and he owns a whole cache of weapons, so I'm very nice to that student. I don't want him showing up at my office one day. So uh, we actually built um, these composite materials out of carbon fiber and took uh, the same round that's in the semi-automatic AR-15. You know, on a serious note, this is the same weapon that the uh, folks in San Bernardino had used. And the bullet rips right through this panel. Uh, but when we changed the material, instead of using stiff carbon fiber, we changed to more elastic fibers, and now we're trying to mimic spider silk to, to do this. The bullets, and you can see multiple rounds go in these panels, but they don't come out the other side. And equally important, if you, if you know any police officers, they want something that's not, gonna, not only going to save their life and stop a bullet, they want that bullet to not penetrate so far through that it breaks their rib cage, which often happens. So this penetration, this, this depth behind it is only less than a millimeter, which is quite impressive. So we've grabbed a lot of attention from a lot of people. Okay, and because we're in the desert, oh, and by the way, I have my students hold the panels. <laughs> Do you trust your engineering? Yes or no? Right. Uh, and so then we also built uh, an IED, an improvised explosive device. Can you click on this, please? And put it on top. This is not the proper way to test IEDs. We're working with Army Research Labs to do this, if you can click on this, uh, thank you. And turn up the volume, it's always fun. Uh, so this is one of our panels, it's five millimeters thick. Uh, and click, uh, there we go, uh, let's see, okay. So this is the panel afterwards, that's where the IED sat. Most of the blast was not directed at the panel, which is why I say we're working with Army Research Labs where we can have proper IED testing. But the bottom line is it's a lightweight material, there is damage here. Um, and we think it can hold, and, and no shrapnel, we think it can hold damage. And now we're making thinner composites. These are 1.5 millimeters, so you can see my hand behind here and doing different types of ballistics testing. Okay. Uh, we're also making, you know, looking at the, mammoth, uh, the mantis structure, you have its inner core, this energy absorbing region, which we put in helmets, which I made one here. I'll just show it to you. So this is one of the helmets we made. So not only do we make flat panels, we can make curved composites. And now we put ceramic coatings on the outside to make them hard, abrasion resistant. And also, if you think about military applications, you can flatten, a, flatten around with this. Okay. Uh, we're also looking at flexible materials, not just the fibers, but the 
material that goes between the fibers called the matrix. Uh, so there's Nick and Steven in my lab testing these the old fashioned way. Um, yeah, they're quite strong, both of the guys. Uh, but the current technology is we use these fibers that are given to us from different companies that make carbon fiber and other, you know, glass fiber. And those fibers are about 1 20th the thickness of your hair, about 5 micrometers. So we said, well, that's great, and that's going to give us a certain thickness composite. What if we can make the fibers thinner? Could we make thinner composites? So I'm using a process called electro spinning, where you basically take a polymer, put it in this little syringe. I just did this yesterday. I wanted to get in the lab and do something instead of being at my computer. So you put this polymer in here, you apply a potential from this needle to this circulating device, and basically it spits out these fibers. And so now we're making the same poly we're using the same polymer that's used to make carbon fiber, and this is the polymer that we've spun. After we heat it up to form carbon, we can make fibers that are about 100 nanometers thick. So that's about one one thousandth the thickness of your hair. So imagine putting those layers in a composite if something is 50 times thinner than what that has for the same number of rotations. So there, there are obvious you know, advantages for this. So that's where we're going with that. And so we're making next gen materials. This is Jesus Rivera, one of my star new PhD students. He took it on his own self to go and buy an NFL helmet and then take the shell off and put a carbon, uh, carbon fiber uh, material around. It's 20% lighter. Now we're doing impact testing to see how, how strong it is. I have a really good set of com uh, uh, guys that, that work with me and gals. Uh, we've, done a, we've actually spun off a startup company. Chris uh, just got his PhD. He's leading this effort. So, uh, Okay. I only have 10 minutes maybe. So what do we also learn about biology uh, for nanomaterials? So we actually, like I said, we understand how nature uh, is architected, but how does nature build things and can we use that to make nanomaterials? Biology uses your bone is made at room temperature or 37 degrees, uh, so, and it uses solution-based processing. Not, you're, you're not made in a CBD reactor. Uh, and it uses organics. You have collagen fibers in your bone that guide the growth of the calcium phosphate that's sitting inside your bone. If you didn't have that calcium phosphate, you wouldn't be standing. So it provides support. And obviously over millions of years, you know, there's optimization of structure to have some type of function. Versus traditional engineering materials often use high temperature, environmentally unfriendly methods. Now that doesn't mean we can always use bio-based uh, methods because some materials really require high temperature methods. That's just the nature of it. Um, so these are just examples of beautiful structures found in biology where we get inspiration. I already talked about the abalone. This is a brittle star. The brittle star is this organism that has arms, uh, and in its arms it has these single crystal arrays of mineral with neurons underneath it, and when there's a predator that comes by over above it, it can detect minute differences in intensity of light. It knows something's there, and it can scuttle away. Uh, these are sponges made of glass found off the coast of Santa Barbara. They're 99% porous, and yet they're mechanically very robust. And these are radial aryans. They just look cool. They look like medieval helmets, so I like that. Okay. All right, so if I look at a biologically formed calcium carbonate, this is what it would look like in the shell. If I look at geological calcium carbonate, this is what it looks like. So biology really gives you this control of size and shape um, and orientation of crystals. So how it does this, if we look inside the shell, we see that it contains, between those plates, layers of organic. And it's that organic that first self-assembles, and then a gel of mineral gets infilled into these spaces and crystallizes. And as it crystallizes, you basically, uh, the crystallization is blocked by this, uh, by this organic layer. And so it controls, again, the size and the shape. So we say, let's use a strategy like that. Let's control the growth of crystals using organics and the like. So we're not trying to make the next generation of solar cells by putting abalones on our house and hoping they work. We're trying to understand how the abalone grows and use that strategy to making nanomaterials for solar applications. We use convergent technologies for either you know, solar or making purified water, batteries, or structural materials, which I talked about already. So I'm going to go through a little bit because I think I'm, I've talked too slow. I get too involved and excited about my research. but. Um, you know, we try and address this. This is really not true anymore, is it? Um, uh, but it will be true again at some point. Gas prices will go up. But regardless, we're burning fossil fuels and we're polluting our atmosphere. We're also polluting our waters. And so, you know, 
could we make solar devices that you know would be able to avoid using uh, this, uh, this these fossil fuels? And I like this. Uh, you know, uh, more energy hits the surface of the Earth in one hour uh, than all the energy used by the world in one year. So you know, it's pretty obvious. But you know, I won't talk about uh, lobbyists in Congress. Okay. All right. So you know, there was one thing that was mentioned. Uh, uh, a calculation that was done that said, for example, if you could build a 50 mile long by 50 mile wide solar panel with the current technology in the U.S. pick a square state where nobody lives, you could power the United States and its needs. So why isn't this happening? Well, but what happens when the sun goes down? We have to store that energy somewhere. So in our lab, we're also interested in making lithium ion batteries that can store this energy. Okay. And so, or we're interested in making cars that can charge faster, drive long distances. So we use the same material that's found in the Chevy Volt uh, in its cathode. There's a cathode and an anode in a battery. And this material is readily available, making it inexpensive, and it's also environmentally friendly, which is great. Unlike what's in your cell phone, it's usually a lithium cobalt oxide, which is a toxic uh, material. So you wouldn't want this. So this is what the crystal structure looks like. Um, it contains the iron and oxygen uh, that are in this certain environment called an octahedra uh, with these phosphate tetrahedra. And because there are strong bonds between the iron and oxygen and phosphorus and oxygen, it makes it really thermally stable versus what's in your uh, cell phone material. Uh, and it also makes it chemically stable, which gives it a long life cycle. But because of those strong bonds, uh, it has poor electronic conductivity. And in order to operate a lithium ion battery, you have to get an electron out to power whatever you're trying to power. So it has to be electrically conductive. So what people do is they often uh, will uh, grind up sugars and, and, uh, and anneal or heat your battery material to make some conductive coating. Um, and also, this has a very low diffusion rate. What it means is lithium ions take a long time to go in and a long time to go out of your batteries. So could you make the size of the battery smaller so the pathway that that lithium ion goes in is shorter? So in our lab, we use this bio-inspiration. We say, here's the shell. The shell is controlled, has controlled growth by using organic. So here's a little organic molecule. And it uses this to, or could we use something like this to guide the growth of these battery materials? And so we do this by taking these organics and during the growth of our crystals for the batteries, we hope that these organics will bind to these structures and control their growth uh, to give us something that might look like this. Um, and so this is all I wanted to show. I'm going to skip the next few slides, but essentially we're making the same, this, these are all the same materials th um, that are in the lithium ion battery. If you looked inside the Chevy Volt, the cathode particle is about five micrometers uh, spherical structure, again, about 1 20th the thickness of a human hair. That's boulders in our world. So we want to make materials, for example, this is a nano belt that's 20 nanometers thick, that's significantly thinner than five microns, um, where the lithium ions will go in and out and can get into that structure faster. So we do this using bio-inspired processing. So because of time limitations, uh, I think I'm going to skip these next slides because it actually shows how these particles form. So uh, I assume that's okay with our uh, our directors upstairs. Um, I want to get to the last topic, and that's this. So why don't you want to live near Lance Armstrong? Why not? What did Lance do? He's famous. He won a bunch of Tour de France's, and then we found out why. He cheated, right. He used steroids. So, bless you. Why don't you want to live near Lance? Because if you're taking hormone-based drugs, endocrine-disrupting compounds, uh, you will including birth control and other types, so even ibuprofen. Your body will process about 50% of that chemical. You pee out the rest. Where does that go? Don't say the ocean. It goes to wastewater treatment plant. Wastewater treatment plant is not capable of handling a lot of these hormone-based drugs. So if you live near Lance, you might have this happening at your dinner table. So could we use some technology to get around this? Uh, by the way, this is, this is some study that was done in the waters of uh, comparing wastewater or hormones in uh, wastewater. So these are birth control drugs. Uh, there are high concentrations in the wastewater, so people are flushing these down the toilet. They end up in surface water, so we water our lawns with this. The water percolates and ends up in aquifers. Good time for me to take a drink. I hope this is purified. Otherwise, I might be growing, growing something that I shouldn't be. Uh, and they're finding these hormones in drinking water. 
which is a big problem. And if you look at the different technologies that are used in wastewater treatment, powder activated carbon chlorination, they're really not effective for a lot of these hormone based drugs. But there is a technology that is, and it's called photocatalysis. What this is, is you take sunlight or light, you shine it on a material, in this case it's a semiconducting material called titanium dioxide, it's found in sunscreens, and when you do this, in the presence of water, you generate radicals. And these radicals can destroy any carbon structure uh, and break it down, essentially, into CO2 and water. Great. So, can we do this? Well, the key here is making the materials in the right way to make them highly active. So, what we do is we engineer uh, a material by controlling its molecular structure where we can basically guide which type of titanium dioxide forms which gives it its maximum activity. And so we've tested these materials and what we've done is, so this is a plot where I've taken a certain organic contaminant and I put it in our water uh, with our reaction, our, our, our catalyst, our titanium dioxide catalyst and we put light on it and we measured how fast it can degrade our organic contaminant. So 100% is the organic is gone. So we compared an industrial photocatalyst. This, this company makes this catalyst. So it takes about 30 minutes for this industrial catalyst to degrade that organic. The materials that we're making using this bio-inspired process are degrading it in about 18 minutes. So that's great. Can we do something more with this? And why isn't this technology in current wastewater treatment systems? Cost. What is so expensive about this process? I have to take these nanoparticles, put them in this reactor, send them down these two banks, shine light on it, that light's going to cause that reaction to occur to degrade the organic, but then what? Do I want to drink nanoparticles? I hope not. So in this case, you have to recollect all these nanoparticles, resuspend them back in here. That takes time and money. So it's not really uh, used in, in current wastewater treatment systems. So we came up with a strategy to get around this. We added a polymer to this reagent that I showed that, that diagram of its chemical structure, put it in these reactors. These reactors are called bombs, by the way, and I never put that in email. I call them autoclaves. Um, anyway, so we mix these two together and we get, we get tater tots. Um, so these tater tots, what they are is polymer, here's a little schematic of it, that is embedded with these little nanoparticles of titanium dioxide. And then we take these tater tots and we can slice them up into little thin disks. So let me count how many are here so I make sure I get them back. Okay, six. <laughs> uh, can I ask you to... So these, so what we're doing now... Thank you very much. So what we're doing now is we're taking those materials... Sorry? We did this section didn't get to... Oh, okay, please. So we're taking these materials that have your tater tot we slice them up into thin little disks, which I'm passing around now. We heat it up, and when we do this, we burn out the polymer. Those little particles of this catalyst fuse together, but when they do, they leave behind pores, holes. So now what we're doing is taking these membranes and putting it into a one-step process where you can flow wastewater through, shine light on it, and hopefully out comes clean water. So that's what we're moving towards. Uh, we're trying to get desalination. That's a big challenge because right now the pores are about five nanometers. That's really small. But to separate salts, we need really small, uh, you know, a tenth, less than a tenth of that. So I talk too long because I always talk too much. Uh, I don't like to read slides. I just like to say we learn from nature both on the structural aspect as well as we learn how nature makes its materials to produce next generation uh, materials. I haven't done much of the work. This is the group that did all the work. I have really talented postdocs. Um, Dong Shang is at Pacific Northwest National Labs. James is at Harvard. Michiko is in uh, Tokyo as a professor. Lessa is at USC as a, uh, a teaching. And uh, I've got a good group of grad students. I have an army of undergrads. I love undergrads because they're so excited and motivated. But as I said, I don't do all this work. The mechanics uh, is really Pablo Zavatieri at Purdue. He's a mechanician. He did a lot of the analysis and also these other collaborators. But we always have to thank the organisms, right? This is the, <laughs> right? So the mantis is over here. This is the, the, the rasping chitin. And this is the uh, abalone. And then, I, of course, I have to thank the funding because grad students are expensive. Um, 
So the research is fun. If anybody wants to join my lab, come up. It can be frustrating, right? Because you do this, the mantis was seven years of research that finally led to our breakthrough. But at the end, my mom and I get to eat uh, these uh, organisms, so it's a lot of fun to, to study these. So anyway, so I'll thank you for your attention. Sorry I went a little over. <laughs>